necessary. So uh, here we have all the speakers of uh, this afternoon's seminar. So now we open the floor for questions and comments from all of you, and I'm certain there, there are questions. Otherwise, I have a couple of ones, I promise you. Please. And as I said earlier, the go bra på svenska också, and then we can translate it into English if necessary. Please. I have a uh, comment or question to Pensal. So I'm happy that you raised the question that uh, the timing of the blood tests is important. I have heard several patients who will be tested in the morning, nine o'clock, and they say they have to stay awake all night because otherwise they will miss it. So as a sleep researcher, I would think uh, staying up all night before blood test will not result in very comparable values. You're absolutely right. But the thing is that some of the people will be all right, and they've only traveled a short distance, and they haven't had any seat problems. So if all the people, all the people had the same problem, that'd be fine. But it's just some do, some don't, and it just upsets the results. So but you're right. Have you ever thought of using a like um, uh, an intervention, like like a like um, exercise, bef uh, um, standardized uh, exercise, or or standing up, or mental well, performance? We've got a. Uh, a major post-exertion malaise study going on. There's one that's already underway looking at the effect of mentally fatiguing tasks and causing alterations in not only in the, uh, the performance but also in cytokines and in glucocorticoid resistance. And then later on the year we'll have the post-exertion malaise study after um, people going on a cyclogometer and then repeating it 24 hours later. And for the comparing conditions maybe prolonged uh, rest uh, in in physical and uh, cognitive yes, performance. No, that's right, yes. Could I, could I ask um, Camilla and Natalie a question? Because uh, we, us English speakers, missed out on it. Is there, is there one simple message you could give us English speakers? One simple message for doctors? from your experiences? Good question. Believe us <laughs> and respect us and help us with the things that you can do. Um, because we know that there is no cure, but uh, we don't want to um, fight against doctors and social service and um, teachers because we want to live. One, uh, uh, extension of that was a survey that Kathy Rowe in Australia did a follow-up asking her uh, MECFS patients several years later uh, what was the most important thing that any of their doctors did and it was just that to believe us so it's a very universal message uh, yes in the middle <coughs> Um, when you have met adult patients, uh, some of whom uh, became ill as adults and some of whom became ill when they were children, uh, what I am wondering, uh, those who became ill as children, uh, do the illness affect the development of the body so that uh, there are differences from uh, uh, between adult patients who have been sick during childhood and those who, well, they had, a, those who became sick as adults, they had a normal development. Have you made any such comparisons? I haven't noticed any difference morphologically uh, between the people who developed the illness in childhood and we see them as adults or people who developed the illness in adulthood. So in terms of their height, weight, all those parameters, they're, they're no different. In terms of their immune function, it doesn't look uh, as we can, whether we can discriminate between the two groups either. 
It's just the presence and severity of the symptoms at that particular point in time that determines what the abnormalities are. I haven't come across that, but in terms of the joint hypermobility, do you want to say anything, Peter? You know, we wondered if um, the, the patients with joint hypermobility would have a different presentation. So with any genetic uh, disorder, you'd expect an earlier onset of illness than something that might have an environmental or infectious cause. It turned out when we looked at the, at least the pediatric patients, the ones who were hypermobile were just as likely to have had the initiation of the illness with EBV infection or an acute thing. Our hypothesis had been they would be the ones that grumble along and, and develop the illness gradually. Uh, so even with some of these subtypes, uh, there's a lot of similarity. Uh, and regarding just morphological things, I, I have always been gratifyingly surprised that quite severe cases still wheelchair bound can grow upwards very well. And some of my patients who are still in wheelchairs became taller than me. So moderately severe ME does not impede upward growth. But um, if you see the film I mentioned earlier, Voices from the Shadows, there is a girl there, uh, the, the first case discussed, who has had it throughout her life. And at the age of 38, she had severe osteoporosis because of being bedridden for so long. She was the one who quite understandably decided to commit suicide. Um, if, I'm, yes, a if I may comment, yeah. uh, I, I would compare this so, uh, with people who are born blind or who become blind at the adult age. So I think this has most uh, importance for adaptation, particularly from the mental point. So this, uh, if you have these symptoms from childhood, you think they, that's normal life. So you may may sort of adapt better to that. So some of my patients said at the age of 31, she understood that that uh, when people run, it's not making, they are not getting, it's not aching. She thought up to age of 31 that everybody will be sick when they when they when they run. So that's normal phenomenon. So I think uh, maybe it is better to have it from the very young children. And then when you get it in the adult, you have maybe harder to uh, cope with it to, because you know what you can be. On a, on a um, separate from the medical and morphological point of view, I have a beautiful story, which maybe some of you can help me with the answer. Uh, a man decided to raise some money for a charity in England by cycling a long way, and he was decided to do it for an ME charity. And they gave him ME families to stay with all the way up Great Britain when he went from the bottom to the top. And when he handed over his large check of money, he said, I didn't know much about this condition. There's something that puzzles him, though. Does ME only affect nice people? <laughs> or does it affect anyone, and then it makes them nice? I don't know. There might be a paper in that. I just noticed that you, you answered mainly uh, on, on, on the uh, morphological aspects and, and immunological aspects. Uh, uh, however, none of you mentioned the cognitive abilities. Not straightforward, forward at least. But I mean, uh, I think it was one of uh, Amulak's uh, pictures, that uh, slides that you showed that uh, uh, the ME patients have an average higher IQ mm. than the general population, so I'm not sure. At if least in the adults that we see, okay, uh, with relatively recent onset disease, yeah. they appear to have a higher than average IQ. I think that's. I don't know whether you see that. Very difficult with I know. Se uh, selection and diagnosis, isn't it? Agree. But um, certainly, I, I, I've had some many intelligent children who have missed two, three, four years at school and end up getting scholarships to Oxford or Cambridge. When, when they recover, their brain is as good as ever. OK, I had a, have a question for Dr. Spey. Uh, uh, it's the question regarding the pacing. Um, I have a daughter 
the age of 17. Uh, it's been nearly quite a few years. And uh, uh, we are, of course, concerned about the danger of, vo of, uh, uh, of exceeding the pace and try too much because she is quite physical and, and uh, like to to stretch the limits uh, and uh, and uh, she is of course uh, having relapse from time to time and uh, our qu question is really is there a, do you see a, a, a danger in in stretching the, uh, the limits too often or something like that that's a very big question and every teenager is different and uh, I used to have the, the, the biggest problems with adolescent boys. They, they were very bad patients and they really hated it and they fought. They didn't want advice, they didn't want anything. I, I have always been very um, liberal with my patients and allowed them to experiment around a baseline and I have not been proscriptive and said you mustn't do that you must do that they've said can I go to this pop concert I'd say well I personally think you shouldn't go and they'd go and they get a bit worse and then I'd say well I did tell you so didn't I but some doctors are uh, and maybe it was a fault maybe I should have been a doctor who says you do not go on that pop concert but it's not my style I'm afraid and parents all have their own styles as well. And uh, I, I, my main reassurance is, if the relapses are small and it is not too excessive, I don't think she will be delaying her full recovery by that much. But obviously, I always tell my patients, make sure you don't get shipwrecked on the Titanic and have some really bad stress. I'd add uh, something to that. In our patients who have um, orthostatic intolerance, uh, when they have a big event coming, we will often help them get through that. Let's say it's their uh, dance, senior dance at high school, or it's a wedding, or something big for their family that they want to go to. I think it's really important that they do enjoy some of these normal adolescent and childhood activities. We will give them one to two liters of warmed normal saline intravenously beforehand. And that often helps boost their uh, function during the several hours that they need for that activity. Usually a saline infusion gives them 24 to 48 hours of better function, um, so it's not a prolonged effect, but it often allows them that uh, glimpse of the important normal activities. We also use it as rescue therapy. If they've ha done something too much and had a crash, it helps them get back up faster. Uh, I, I once... Yes, go ahead. It's pretty cheap. <laughs> Anyone it's, who wants you, to you've answer got that a lot question? Of salt water around here, I've noticed. <laughs> I'm only a research doctor, so I won't give an answer to that. Not a physician. Sim simply intravenous fluid with normal saline, uh, two liters over two hours, for the average adolescent. Has anyone tried it? from what we know at least no we found that it was a very helpful response to uh, the after the tilt table test our m mistake was that we never studied it formally we just thought it was a reasonable thing to do people would come in get their tilt test feel terrible we'd give them the IV saline and they left feeling better than when they came in so it helped reinforce the message that they had to drink uh, lots of fluid and eat lots of salty foods uh, but we use it as a way of tolerating the tilt test, which is otherwise a, a fairly big orthostatic stress. This is nothing that has been published scientifically. There is not one, yet, at least. There are two papers on okay. the use of uh, saline and volume infusion that I know of. One from 1982 in POTS, 
uh, it reversed the norepinephrine rise with standing, and one in uh, those with recurrent syncope, showing that it modulated the autonomic tone and allowed people to be upright for longer. Thank you. I'm not sure who's next. Use the microphones. Yeah. Who's first? Down there? Okay. Hey, uh, my name is Indre Junger, and we're working with adults at, at uh, Danderyd Hospital, adults with ME. Unfortunately, we uh, do not have before. Uh, A little bit louder, Indre. Unfortunately, we do not have resources to perform this kind of treatment. You suggest, for example, saline and uh, other uh, treatments, uh, for example, vitamin B. 12 injection. I'm very uh, glad that you are here and sharing your experiences working with children. We're working with adults, but we're getting uh, requests uh, request about children from the whole Sweden. And of course, we have to deny the, uh, all, re all referrals because we, we don't accept uh, children. But we uh, somehow uh, have uh, got some um, youth uh, between 17 18 years old uh, and i've uh, i'm very glad to hear that the prognosis might be good for young uh, people uh, and that we were missing a lot this knowledge just to take it maybe a little bit easy uh, not to be so anxious ourselves it was very very uh, valuable knowledge you bring here and I also have a, a question maybe to politicians. What about children and ME in Stockholm County? Because as I said, we're getting these questions and I don't have any answer to give to the parents. Oops, am I the only politician, yes. county council member still in this hall? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as Stig Nyman mentioned earlier, we have this uh, recently decided uh, procurement, so to say, of uh, healthcare and, and rehabilitation, as you, you probably know about. So I think it's, it's not a perfect solution. However, as he mentioned, which was uniquely unique, is that we had a unanimous decision about that in the healthcare committee, with all the parties agreeing on this. Uh, I think that's a start. Uh, what about children in, in that kind of, of uh, care and, and uh, rehabilitation? I'm not sure about actually. I think we have to start perhaps with adults and, and then we'll see how we can uh, meet uh, the demand, so to say, when it comes to children and adolescents. But I think that the input from, from the profession, the healthcare professions, uh, is very important in this uh, kind of, of uh, work for the future, and it's it's important to have a dialogue uh, with politicians and healthcare professionals, of course. That's the the best uh, answer I can give. Perhaps we have some more from. Yes, I, I can give a the office of the Christian quick, quick Democrats. answer. Uh, yeah. Mats Nilsson, uh, political advisor to Mr. Neiman. Uh, children are included in the um, procurement that's going to take effect next year, so children will be treated uh, along with adults. Uh, in Stockholm, so they're included. It's just there's a difference in uh, when and who is able to refer them. The children have to go through uh, the pediatric uh, institutions or um, OLB or one of the, those. So they can't be referred to from uh, the basic uh, GP because there are other things you have to take into account when you refer children so as you don't miss anything else, like Mr. Nima said, but children will be included. Uh, the question to the panel I have is uh, the NME project that uh, Professor Davis uh, in America has, has started, uh, Ronald Davis. Uh, do you think this will have any impact uh, on uh, the knowledge amongst doctors about ME? Because what I'm concerned about when we're trying to, we actually have funds to give uh, concerning ME but we're finding it difficult to find doctors at Karolinska who wants the money, because basically they say, oh, ME, that's not really my area. Uh, the ne neuro ne neurologists say, oh, try the medical profession, and 
the medical doctors say, oh, try the endocrinologists and so on and so forth. It's kind of a blame game. And do you have a, f what do you see in the future? Is, do, you, is, do you see a breakthrough or when will the doctors of the world wake up to the problems of this disease? I'm frustrated from, from the political side that we want more that's actually able to give. I'll, uh, I'll try and address that. I don't know specifics about Dr. Davis's program. Um, I've been involved in, in uh, a United States uh, committee from the National um, Academy of Sciences, the Institute of Medicine, where we've had a meeting uh, or a, a committee looking at uh, the criteria and the evidence about ME-CFS and whether the name should be changed. But as part of that deliberation, we've come up with about a 300-page report describing the state-of-the-art evidence about this being a real disease. I'm uh, not allowed to give you a whole lot more information than that, but it will be coming out in March. Our hope, because there's a dissemination plan with the report, our hope is that this will help uh, people all over the world but especially in the U.S. where we face the same problems you face. I have trouble at Johns Hopkins, which is a place with a similar kind of international reputation to the Karolinska, finding anyone who wants to work on this. It's a bit like, um, you know, it's, uh, 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 it's a condition with bad public relations. People find that uh, they are unwilling to work on it because there's no consistent funding that will allow them to extend their research career. So in the U.S., the NIH gives $3 million per year for CFS research. That's a tiny amount for the number of people affected, and it is not enough to fund more than one or two people every few years. It doesn't give them consistent research funding to continue their career. So there's a disincentive there. I think the problem would be fixed if there was a pot of money and consistent uh, funding for research scientists. I think they, they can find interesting questions here. This is a fascinating illness. It's got lots of unanswered questions. It needs that kind of level of scientific inquiry. Uh, but I think until there's consistent research funding, we're all in trouble. Okay, now I think we have perhaps, will that be the final question or what do you say, Hendrik and others? Perhaps a couple of minutes past five, okay. So we'll have perhaps three more questions. Yes? No, in the back first. Okay, sorry. sorry. Um, I, first of all, I'm Kaisa Tammi Moilanen coming from Finland. I'm a mother of ME child and um, also representing uh, the Patients Association from Finland. Uh, I have a question for all the experts here um, about the severe ME cases because um, uh, I have an understanding uh, that uh, my daughter and after that that we published, um, um, we, we made it public to that what what our daughter was going through, we started to get contacts from families having uh, similar uh, symptoms. And I would like to ask about the symptoms, because you, uh, every once in a while you talk about the severe ME, but um, I'm more interested to hear, is it, uh, do you have experience of uh, patients who have seizure-like um, um, seizures? Uh, as, a, as a symptoms, there is uh, children I know now who have so-called myoclonic episodes, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, the switches of the um, muscles, and also children with the hallucinations uh, at the night time. Uh, I would like to ask about these severe, very strange, strange symptoms. What do you know about this? Yeah, all right. Um Thanks very much. I, I did mention on my, one of my slides myoclonic jerks, and they are, I have seen that quite a lot. There are some, some attacks which are so severe and so synchronous that they appear like epilepsy, and that's r quite rare, but in very severe cases that is that. The other thing one notices is the acute pain sensitivity and hyperesthesia. Um, I don't think I've met 
true hallucinations, but I'm sure they can get confusional states and maybe delusions. They can have very severe sleep disturbance, sometimes only sleeping 20 minutes and 24 hours. And, um, so all that is recognized. The trouble with the epilepsy-like attacks <coughs> is the neurologists get very annoyed because the EEG is normal and they say it's pseudo-epilepsy and send them to the psychiatrist because they just don't recognize it. Yeah, that's correct. Friends agree. You? <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so do we have the, the final question now? <clears throat> uh, this is more a comment on the, from the uh, uninterested doctors at Karolinska, uh, which I represent. No, not un uninterested. But I think you are quite right uh, if you go back a couple of years. But it's happening things now, uh, not at least as we see with these seminars on uh, ME in children. Uh, I'm a pain physician, pediatric pain physician, and uh, I have seen quite a lot of cases because they are often referred to our unit. Um, otherwise, I think the neuro, uh, neuropediatrician has quite a lot of experience because they see a lot of patients. I've been discussing with uh, this uh, issue with uh, neuropediatricians and also with one very interested rheumatologist. And we have discussed to, to start uh, from the beginning a uh, sort of a network of knowledge. Uh, actually, all of us see those patients, but it's in a, uh, quite a few cases compared to what we ha probably have in Stockholm area. According to Peter Rose figures of prevalence, we probably have at least 400. So uh, we are prepared. It's now more, I think, if the politicians want us to, to make... Um, uh, start uh, in a, a larger scale, we are prepared. Okay, thank you. So I think that will be the conclusion of uh, this seminar. It's been uh, really interesting. It's, uh, it, it is an important seminar that we've attended and these issues will be discussed further, of course, have to be. So from my point of view, I just want to thank all the speakers uh, and thank you, the audience, and then I will give the, the word over to, I think, the, the president of the Patient Association, RME Stockholm. Henrik, please, thank you. And um, I would <clears throat> like to start by uh, thanking Mr. Silvestri who has acted a moderator, and you did a good job, and you needed to use the hammer once. <laughs> but uh, no one got hurt, at least. Um, and I also want to, to thank uh, all the wonderful speakers. And I think we have seen here four different perspectives of MECFS. Uh, it was uh, uh, Peter Rowe about orthostatic intolerance, symptoms, treatments, Nigel Spite about ignorance and denial of MECFS in healthcare and in the society. And we see a lot of that in Sweden too, unfortunately. Uh, and Dr. Amelak about uh, factors, uh, immune factors, cytokines, all the complicated stuff that is um, probably behind the illness. Uh, and lastly, Natalie and uh, Camilla about the patient and the mother perspective. So I think we have four different, four various views of MECFS here. That was re really interesting to listening to. Um, and it was also positive to hear that, that uh, Camilla and Natalie, that, that as you said, that the school is really taking measures to actually um, make it able to you to, to go to school, to attend and do as much as you can. So there are pos positive uh, sides too, actually. Um, the take home lesson is that we still have a lot of things to investigate in the MECFS field. More studies are needed, more education among doctors and healthcare workers and school personnel, teachers. So we need to, uh, to help each other to spread the, the information and the knowledge about MECFS.
Uh, if you want some material to take home, the patient association has a table in the hallway where, where we give away and sell uh, the DVD, for example, Voices from the Shadow, as Nigel mentioned. We have uh, a very good book about MECFS and we have some brochures that you can buy and postcards. So, I hope you found this seminar interesting and uh, next year we will have some other focus on the seminar and I hope you will attend next year too. So thank you very much from the patient organization.